Um, so this is regarding our CPU core. So we have good news, and it's coming, and it's 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 in the market. You can read about it in the net, and it's an interesting technology, mainly for HPC uh, architecture, which we talk about here. But I came to talk about a completely different uh, creature, which I call it, which is the CPU, the GPU, um, and it's quite different in what it is optimized for. You know, a, a CPU is optimized for uh, low latency, so you want to take one thread and run it as fast as you can. So it has very large caches and all kinds of other tricks that it does to, to make the, the single thread run much faster than so. Uh, on the left, you can see these, are, these were the first generations. Uh, it was fixed uh, function hardware, so you just input triangles, input textures, mix, play a bit with some environment variables, which uh, we call state variables, and you had a picture out of that. Uh, so it was nice for graphics, but you know, the graphic developer says we want more. We want to make very nice shading. We want the face of this girl to look more realistic than the fixed uh, calculation that you give us, please let us program the uh, shading effects. Okay, so we did that. Uh, we switched to a, uh, we call it the simple shader era, in which you can write simple shaders. They were very limited in what you, you can do. You cannot uh, call functions or, or do iterations or anything s smart like that. It was programmed in assembly. But you can program the, G the GPU, and you get some very nice uh, effects. And this era, people started playing with this assembly and said, wait, we can do more than just graphics on this creature. You know, it's uh, highly optimized for uh, throughput. Let's do some physics and some other things on that. But it was very hard because, again, the, uh, the hardware was limited and the, uh, the programming uh, model was quite horrible, I must say. Um, so, in 2007, approximately, we entered the, what we call the third era, um, in which we have languages which are general purpose languages. They are not only graphic languages. Um, we have CAL, uh, there was Brook, which is a, a university project, and uh, now we have uh, OpenCL, which is Open Compute Language. And you can just take a language which is C with some extensions, and you can program it to run on the GPU. So uh, you can, if your task is suitable for this device, which means that you can uh, divide your algorithm to crunch um, quite lo lots of uh, data sections in parallel, then the GPU gives you very nice performance. Um, however, in 2007, up till now approximately, the GPU was still designed for graphics. And now we are switching gears. We have something that we call Graphic Core Next, which is our new design. It was released to the market. And in this design, compute is a first class citizen. So we do the chip for graphics, and we do it for compute, and it's optimized for both. I must say that compute had a very large portion of the design of this chip. So. You get a chip which graphics is important, but it's definitely optimized from compute. And I think it's very good news for the HPC community. <coughs> um, you know, in each such lecture, you need to have this graph, you know, to show, shift, to show everyone how fast are we are. And we are very fast. This is uh, the HD7970, which we just released. It uh, gets to 3.8 flo floating point operations per second, which is numbers that you can definitely not find on a CPU. And it's Tesla. comparing to Tesla, where are you standing? Um, I think we are a bit faster. I'm not sure how well, how well, how fast is the fastest Tesla. I don't know. Uh. Offer, do you know the number? How fast is the fastest Tesla? Single precision or double precision? Single precision. Single precision is around. Yeah. Slightly more than 10. 10.5. 10.5. Yeah. You know, there is a battle between, uh, between us and NVIDIA, and every NVIDIA. half a year someone releases a technology, and, uh, and, it, and, and it becomes faster, and then the other company releases technology and becomes faster. 
Uh, currently, we are faster. So how much is the double consumption? Double precision. We'll get to that. Okay, we'll get to the double precision numbers. So, um, and this lists a few of the fields in which uh, we are playing a part of. And of course, any field that can take the task. Divide it into very small tasks or to a uh, data parallel task is very suitable for this device. Um, so just to give an explanation for people who doesn't know what a GPU is. Um, so uh, the, the basic unit is an ALU. You know, ALU can, uh, can perform 32 uh, bit uh, single precision, either floating or integer operations like you're used to and um, and if you take four of them it can do a 64-bit uh, double precision uh, calculations and uh, if you take 16 out of these you get a vector unit and why is it a vector unit because an ALU doesn't live alone because we are optimized for data parallel computation all of these share the same instruction pointer. So it's a single instruction, many data processor. So let's say I have an A equals A plus one, then all of these are doing exactly the same instruction, the A equals A plus one, but for different data parts. Okay? So these 16s, 16 ALUs are working together. And they share the instruction pointer and also uh, a bulk of registers. Questions? Anyone has a question? Ask. Um, if we take four, uh, com four vector units, we get a compute unit. And uh, this yields 64 ALUs. And it has some more parts. Um, this is uh, what we call some kind of an independent unit that, that, that you can put as many as you like in a GPU. So it has uh, the 64 ALUs. It has the 64 kilobyte of uh, local data storage that is, can be used by these ALUs. And for example, OpenCL and Direct Compute and the parallel programming languages expose this, so you can use this uh, local data storage. It has a sequencer that uh, actually issues the instructions to the wavefronts. Uh, and it has an L1 cache, which is uh, relatively small comparing to uh, a CPU. But I, I want to put it here exactly to explain what is the difference between a CPU and a GPU. A CPU is very large. Uh, uh, Cache is trying to hide uh, the latency. And here, what we do is we run a lo lots of threads. We call a thread a wavefront. Why is it a wavefront? Because it executes 64 uh, units at the same time, 64 data units at the same time. So let's say we, we have a wave running here. And let's say it, it hits data that it doesn't have in the registers, and it needs to access the memory. So what it, uh, the GPU does is just put it aside and runs a different wave. And then the other wave hits some kind of uh, condition which doesn't let it run. It puts it aside and runs another one. So you can have thousands of waves running in parallel. Some of them are waiting, some of them are processing. And eventually what we get is very large throughput. Again, it's not optimized for latency, it's optimized for throughput. Is this sounds reasonable? OK, yeah? I, I'll talk about it. Okay. Very good. Okay. So uh, this is a compute unit. Uh, if we take a few compute units, we can build a GPU out of that. So <coughs> I'll talk about the Tahiti GPU. Tahiti GPU is is our latest core, uh, built out of Graphic Core Next. This is what we talked about. Uh, it's found in the, the commercial uh, name is AMD Radon HD7970. It has 32 compute units, which is 2,048 ALUs, okay, which is a very big number. It runs at nine and 925 uh, megahertz clock speed. Uh, so if you do the math, you get to 3.8 teraflops of 32-bit math. Or if you want to do double precision, it's 947 gigaflops. And that's, that's very fast. Um, we South of Akron, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have a very nice uh, memory. It's GDDR5, which is very fast comparing to what you have on, on CPUs. And it's a uh, 3 gigabyte out of that. OK? 
So that's roughly in a you know, 2,000 miles view how a GPU is built. Um, if we took computing wise, let's say I was a programmer in the early days, then there was the single core era, you know, I wrote my program in uh, Pascal or Fortran or C or whatever, and life was fun, you know, every two years the computer power got uh, faster, and I just had to wait and the program, program ran faster, and it was really fun. However, you know, every free lunch has an end, so we hit some walls, uh, for example, uh, power consumption and heat. I don't think that you want uh, a core which is hi as heat as the sun in your desktop and uh, that consume too much power and the cores become more and more complex um, so uh, we need to do other things so the smart people in uh, AMD and other companies said and say okay if we can do one that will run faster let's do a few of those okay so we switch to the multi-core era and then you, you, you had the double core, quad core, etc., etc., and it was really fun, uh, except that eventually we hit another wall, which a uh, few walls, uh, I must say. Again, power, you know, if you put one, you consume X power. If you put two, three, four, five, six, eight, you consume more, more power eventually. Uh, the main barrier, which I think is uh, hard, is the uh, software stack. If you look at, uh, let's say, at your uh, laptop, most of the programs that run there doesn't really know how to use more than one core. And uh, Intel and AMD are working hard on that. Uh, on for the HPC, there is a very interesting software stack for doing that. Uh, but most of the software doesn't really know how to use that. So you don't reach a good scalability. Uh, so to make things more interesting, we are now entering a new era, which we call the heterogeneous era, in which you have a few CPU cores, uh, quite a lot of GPU cores, and I don't know, some DSPs or whatever other processors in your system, and I'm telling the programmer, go and program on, on top of that. So people say, first they talk to me, they say, you're completely nuts. And then we explain what we try to do there and say, okay, this might work. So we are now just entering this era. Um, so again, it's uh, very power efficient and the uh, performance is very nice because you can use either the CPU or the GPU or the other devices which are optimized. Each of them is optimized for a different task. Um, but again, the constraint is the programming model and the communication over it because uh, you need to, let's say, copy the data from the CPU to the GPU, do the computation, get it back, and manage all this thing is definitely not fun. So AMD came with a new kind of device. Uh, it's not a CPU, it's not a GPU. We call it an APU, which is Accelerated Processing Unit. And what exactly is that? We just take a few CPU cores and quite a lot of GPU cores and put them together with shared memory on the same silicon die. So you get something that is very efficient power-wise and uh, very efficient communication-wise because sometimes you don't need to copy the data, you can just you know, give the other guy a pointer and say, go. And it's a very nice design. So you guess both the CPU, which is uh, optimized for low latency, and the GPU, which is optimized uh, for throughput, and you can play with them and do each task in the device that, that suits its best. Uh, this is ex an example for a, a definitely not, not a high-end one. It's an A uh, series APU. And uh, it, you can see that it has uh, four CPU cores and quite a lot of uh, GPU cores and a uh, few L2 caches, etc., uh, etc. Et it consumes, usually it's a uh, 45 watt, and you reach uh, 500 gigaflops on this one. And this is called Lano. You can just uh, go to, I don't know, Amazon and, and order a laptop containing this one. So it's a very interesting design. Uh, again, the main problem, as I see it, is the programming model. We, it's very hard to program for these guys, and we want to eventually make this as programmable as the CPU is today. Okay? What so, do you mean? what do I mean? That's, this is exactly the next slide. Okay? So, first, we are trying to use open standards. 
Why is that? Because we believe in two things. First, that open standards usually win over time for proprietary standards. Because people like to write software that will run on a few platforms and not only one. That's one. And second, <coughs> uh, open standards usually yield larger ecosystems. So uh, for compute, we have, uh, for example, OpenCL, OpenGL is for graphics, and DirectX is both for compute and graphics. You have a portion which is called Direct Compute, which is very interesting there. Um, and all kinds of other uh, standards that are not listed here. <coughs> for example, uh, Microsoft is pushing hard a new high-level language, which is called C++ AMP, uh, which is uh, definitely aimed for the mass developer. And uh, it's very easy to program. You won't get you know, the maximal potential of the hardware, but you'll invest, let's say, 20% of the work and get, let's say, 50% of the potential. And it's a very good news. Um, so this slide <coughs> talk about the, uh, the evolution of, of uh, heterogeneous computing and where we are heading. This is exactly the question that the person there asked. So. First, there were some proprietary uh, APIs like uh, CUDA and Brook and all kinds of things like that. And now we switch to a standard APIs, which are quite low level, like uh, OpenCL, Direct Compute, uh, which are a subset of uh, C++ and are uh, really nice to program, but uh, are definitely aimed for, let's say, the expert developers and not the mass market. And what I call the mass market is, let's say, the typical uh, Java de developer or the .NET developer or the people that are not bold with glasses like me, let's say. Okay? Um, and we would like to move into this era in which you have full C++ support on the GPU. So you can write your code as you're used to. And uh, it will run either on the CPU or on the GPU. <coughs> You, uh, we want to have a unified coherent address space, and this means that I can take a virtual pointer on the CPU, pass it to the GPU, and say go, and it will run. Uh, we'll talk about this later. I I'll go into these details in the next slide. Okay, so <coughs> we have a nice roadmap for achieving that. Uh, the first step <coughs> is uh, <coughs> physical integration. So we want to integrate both the CPU and the GPU on the same silicon die. We did that. Uh, unified memory con con controller, we did that. And common manufacturing theorem, that's obvious. You know, we can produce both of them if we don't have that. So this is done. Uh, we want to have a platform that you can support C++ on the GPU. We are definitely on the way there currently. If you download our latest driver, you can have what we call static open uh, C++. You can do use templates and things like that and, and uh, program the GPU. You can't do yet uh, new, or we don't have yet a heap on the GPU, but it's definitely in plan. So we do uh, plan to have full C++ support on the GPU. Uh, user mode scheduling. Currently, if you want to, let's say, take uh, work and push it to the GPU, you need the user mode driver, like let's say OpenCL, called the kernel mode driver, and then it dispatched the, the work. This creates some latency. So we have a new design that tells the user mode, here is the uh, queue or the ring of the GPU. You can just push work there and, and it will work. You don't need to pass through the kernel mode driver. Uh, power management between the CPU and the GPU, that's obvious. Uh, unified address space, this is very important. Again, you want to take a pointer and pass it between the CPU and the GPU. Uh, we want the GPU to, <coughs> to use and be part of the virtual page system of the operating system. So um, we have a new standard, it's called IOMMU v2, which enables the GPU to be a part of the virtual paging system. So for example, let's say uh, the CPU loads a huge tree, a data structure. And it can give the GPU a pointer, and the GPU can run on the tree. If it reaches a page that doesn't reside in the memory, it issues a page fault. The page will enter the memory, and the GPU will continue running. So this is a very good uh, revolution. So then you can, you can do new, and uh, you actually have a heap. Uh, I can have a heap, and uh, I can. This is over, let's say, the, yeah. I can. Do you uh, complicated uh, 
it, yeah, for having it, you need something a bit more than that, which is a, a runtime on the GPU itself. Uh, or you could use the, let's say, the CPU heap. That's, you can do either. And, uh, and this actually gives you, uh, let's say, it's very, you can, let's say, work on very large data sets that doesn't reside in memory. And you can use the page uh, tables and page system, paging system to, to work on that from the GPU. This is something that you couldn't do before. Or you could share it the memory between some several processes, CPU processes. Yeah. Uh, coherency between the memory of the CPU and the GPU, actually, we can work either way. We can work in a coherent way or in a non-coherent way. So if you, let's say, write from the CPU to the GPU memory or vice versa, you sometimes want the other side to know that you wrote something that so that the caches will be updated. And sometimes you know that you're not going to do anything with that. So you can write faster and don't update the caches. So we have both, op both options. Um, we would like to have uh, the ability to do context switching on the, on the GPU, not just, just in the wave level, but take the entire process, throw it out, and take it back afterwards. Uh, preemption, uh, and this is very important. Um, use both APUs, which are on the same die, <laughs> and if you have to, to have more horsepower,